it's it's an honor uh, to introduce our second speaker to the session, uh, Professor Michael Brenner. Uh, Michael is is the Elizabeth Fay Brigham Professor of Medicine at Harvard Med Medical School and director of the Human Immunology Center at the Single Cell Genomics Core at Brigham and Women's Hospital, Boston. He's also the director of Cell and Molecular Immunology in the Division of Rheumatology, Inflammation and Immunity at BWH. Uh, Brenner Lab uh, designs and implements high dimensional immunophenotyping, single cell transcriptomic analysis and functional studies to deconstruct human autoimmune disorders. In rheumatoid arthritis, his laboratory has made a number of big discoveries. For example, his lab has defined subsets of fibroblasts that mediate joint pathology. He also defined a new T helper cell population called T peripheral helper T cells that are pathologically expanded in rheumatoid arthritis. Most recently, his lab has identified a super activated macrophage state in inflamed tissue across several diseases. Together, these studies are reconstructing the immune pathology of rheumatoid arthritis and other autoimmune disorders. In addition to these findings, his lab has met several fundamental discoveries in immune biology. So without any further delay, welcome, Michael, and we look forward to hearing you today. Great, <clears throat> thank you. Okay, can you see my... Uh presentation yeah but not in the presentation mode yeah now it's getting oh, okay yeah. just a minute okay that looked good yeah excellent thank you please okay Okay, so it's a pleasure to be with you today uh, to talk about identifying new pathogenic lymphocytes. And in this case, I'm gonna focus on T cells in human autoimmune diseases using high dimensional single cell approaches uh, to show you how we're beginning to find new things that could be targets for drug development uh, and help us understand the immunologic basis, pathologic basis for autoimmune inflammatory diseases. Now the disease I'll focus on primarily for the initial work is rheumatoid arthritis. This is what RA looks like here on the left with very swollen uh, joints, uh, with, de with destruction of the joints over time. And uh, to get an idea of what, the, what swelling inside the joint is, it's the synovial membrane which lines the joints. That's shown over here on the right. Uh, this is uh, intraoperative pictures of a knee from a normal person here on the left and from a patient with rheumatoid arthritis here on the right, where you can see this massively hyperplastic tissue growing over the febrile condyles, the cartilage here, destroying uh, the joint uh, in this uh, setting. Now, when you look at what tissue is inside uh, that massive hyperplastic tissue, histologically, the normal synovium shown here is a bland tissue, it has a little lining, it's loose connective tissue, it produces lubricants for the joint. In the lower part here, you can see that in rheumatoid arthritis, uh, the tissue becomes hyperplastic and all of the blue staining here in H&E represents this massive infiltration of leukocytes, T cells, B cells, um, uh, and, and other uh, macrophages, other leukocytes. And so what we're gonna think about today is identifying some of the pathogenic T cell populations in this inflamed synovial tissue. Well, why do we think about T cells in RA? <clears throat> the main reason is um, that the strongest genetic association with RA is with MHC class two, implicating a likely uh, presentation of antigens to CD4 T cells. And when we think about CD4 T cells, and here I have to give a very brief immunology lesson, um, we have uh, different T helper cell subsets, and they're referred to as Th1, Th2, and, and other T helper populations. Now, uh, Th1 cells <clears throat> mainly make interferon gamma. They're important for intracellular infections like TB. Th2 cells make IL-4, IL-13, 
and they're important in allergic reactions and parasites. And when the paradigm recognizing these different T helper cells uh, came about, people thought, well, RA must be a Th1 disease, an interferon gamma disease, because it's not like an allergic disease. That probably turns out not to be true. Um, subsequently, other T cell helper cell subsets were identified like TH17 cells that make IL-17. And so uh, actually two clinical trials uh, were carried out to, because RA was thought possibly to be a TH17 disease. This also did not work out very well. Uh, there are other T helper cell populations. There are T regulatory cells, and I'll mention in particular T follicular helper cells these are cells that live in lymph node follicles that help B cells differentiate and make antibodies. So the approach we took was not to go look for each of these different T helper populations and characterize them. But instead, what we did is use an unbiased approach using high dimensional CYTOF, single cell RNA sequencing and, and other methods to um, characterize the, the, the cells that are present in this inflamed synovium and ask what are they uh, with no preconceived ideas. Um, and um, the, the first example I'll show you comes from high dimensional CYTOF data. This is work carried out by Deepak Rao when he was a postdoc in the lab. And shown here is a TISNI display, dimensional reduction of all of the CD4 T cells stained with a panel of about 40 different markers. And what I draw your attention to is the population circled here in red, uh, with black circle of the red staining, highly expressing cells, which were expressing PD-1 at very high levels. And this was unexpected in the CD4 population in rheumatoid arthritis. Now, what might PD-1 high cells be? Well, they could be exhausted cells. We all know about PD-1 high CD8 exhausted cells in cancer, for example. They could be recently activated or they could be these T follicular helper cells mentioned just a moment ago, because they're characterized by the normal expression of high levels of PD-1. They also have a marker called CXCR5. That's a chemokine receptor, which is important in localizing them to, a, to uh, a lymph node follicles uh, to associate with B cells. And they produce IL-21 and CXCL-13. These are cytokines and chemokines that drive B cell differentiation. Um, so we asked, you know, are these cells T follicular helper cells, TF8 cells? Well, to show you what TF8 cells look like, this is flow cytometry from a tonsil, and this is standing for CXCR5 on the X axis and PD-1 on the Y axis. And these cells in tonsil <clears throat> that are PD-1 high and express CXCR5 are TF8 cells, T follicular helper cells as expected. But in the synovial tissue, that's not what we found. The T follicular helper cells, which would be in this quadrant, were minor. Instead, this population of cells lacked CXCR5, so quite different from the CXCR5 population that's the typical T follicular helper cell. Um, the next thing we noticed about uh, this finding is that these PD-1 high cells in synovial tissue were very abundant. They're quantitated here about 25 to 30 percent of all the CD4 T cells but only in this, the rheumatoid arthritis patients that had autoantibodies, so-called seropositive RA, not in the seronegative RA, the ones that lack autoantibodies. This turns out to be very important in understanding what these cells are and what they do. Well, to think about what they might do functionally, we characterize their gene expression. And to make a long story short, they make IL-21 and CXCL-13 these are the cytokines and chemokines that are important in attracting B cells, CXCL13, and activating their differentiation, IL21. And so it looked like these cells might be like the T follicular helper cells, but they just lacked CXCR5. <clears throat> and so we tested if they could drive B cell differentiation in the plasma cells. And that's shown here, where we co cultured these PD1 high cells with memory B cells, and that drove the expansion of plasma cells, whether we got these cells from synovial tissue or fluid. And the T, these cells did it just as well as the T follicular helper cells. So we named them TP8 cells, which stands for T peripheral helper cells to distinguish them from the T follicular helper cells, which are in lymph nodes. These cells are out in the synovium in the inflamed joint, not in the lymph nodes. Sorry, having a little trouble advancing my slides here. Um, 
And then the next thing we notice, this is work carried out by Deepak Rao after he left my lab and joined his own lab, he found that these cells were also highly expanded in lupus, not just RA. And in lupus, they also drove B cell differentiation. And as shown here, these TPH cells correlated with SLE disease activity index, that is disease severity. These cells have since been described in a whole host of other autoimmune diseases besides RA and SLE, including autoimmune hepatitis, celiac disease, Sjogren's type one diabetes, colitis, juvenile arthritis, and so forth. And in this interesting study from Mark Davis's lab, cells with the phenotype of these TP8 cells were found to be the, the um, gluten reactive cells he identified with tetramers. So they may include the antigen specific cells in these autoimmune inflammatory diseases. So in summary for this part of the talk, when you look at the synovium and RA as shown here on the left in immunofluorescence staining, staining T cells in red and B cells in, in green, you see lots of TB aggregates. In fact, you, know, you just see these accumulations of T cells and B cells throughout the synovium. Um, and so we think these is this is where these TP8 cells are found and driving B cell differentiation. And so to put this in context, what we knew about before are T follicular helper cells, an important CD4 T cell population that has CXCR5 that localizes in lymph nodes in the follicles and in the lymph node follicles drives B cell responses and antibody production. And this is the main germinal center reaction for antibody generation in the body. And what we've found looking at rheumatoid arthritis inflamed synovial tissue is a related cell, but one that's different. We call it a T peripheral helper cell, similar in many ways, except instead of having CXCR5 directing it into follicles and lymph nodes, it has peripheral homing chemokine receptors like CCR2, CCR5, CX3, CR1, and so forth. This localizes them in inflammatory tissues like the synovium and in these other autoimmune diseases. And there it drives B cell differentiation and antibody production in these peripheral tissues. So we think this is an important new T helper cell uh, we've discovered in autoimmune disease through high dimensional CYTOF studies. Now, another approach to high dimensional analysis in autoimmune diseases has been taken by the Accelerating Medicines Partnership Consortium. This is an NIH and industry co-funded co -funded consortium to deconstruct RA and SLE. And in this consortium, there are a lot of biopsies carried out at many sites of the synovium. And then the biopsy tissue is subjected to a whole variety of uh, interrogations, um, including histology. And then the tissue is disaggregated and we carried out site seek so that we could both get a single cell mRNA library and the single cell protein library from the site seek staining on the same cells. In addition, the cells from the disaggregated synovial tissue were sorted into cell types like fibroblasts, monocytes, B cells, and T cells, and then bulk RNA-seq was carried out. I'm going to show you data from this part of the pipeline and this part of the pipeline. Just to be complete, there was also a TAC-seq and immune repertoire carried out, which I won't talk about today. So I'm going to start first with an analysis of the sorted cell types by bulk RNA-seq from the rheumatoid synovium. And that's shown here. This represents a comparison of the, the dozen most highly upregulated genes in leukocyte-rich RA synovial tissue. So this is inflamed RA compared to OA. And when you look across the most upregulated genes, I marked an asterisk CXCL13, ICOS, TIGIT, and PDCD1, which is the gene named for PD1, these are all the markers of TP8 cells. So actually at the bulk RNA-seq level in an independent study, the dominant signature is in the T cells for the TP8 cells. The next thing we observed is the next most highly upregulated gene was interferon gamma. So remember I started out by saying that people thought RA is a Th1 disease, Th1 helper cells make interferon gamma. And so we looked to see at the single cell level, which cells are making the interferon gamma. But what was not the CD4 T cells, 
but it was instead a number of clusters of the CD8 T cells, which was really quite a surprise. And so this next population uh, of, of pathological T cells that we're identifying, I'm gonna to talk to you about are a population of CD8 positive T cells. Okay, so the first thing we did is to ask, really, are CD8 T cells that highly expanded in the RA synovium? Because people seem to focus on CD4 T cells. And what's shown here is if you look at all of the disaggregated cells from the synovium and RA, and you ask what percent of these cells are CD4 or CD8, that's shown here, they each make up about 20% of all the cells in the tissues, the fibroblasts, the endothelial cells, everything. And actually they're both about equally expanded, <clears throat> both nearly 20% of the cells in, in the synovial tissue. This turns out to be about 40%, there are 40% of the T cells, but the important finding we confirmed uh, by flow cytometry, as we had seen at the single cell level, is that the CD8 T cells, a higher proportion of them make interferon gamma than do the CD4 T cells, just something that, that is not understood or typically appreciated uh, in the literature. The CD8s are the source of interferon gamma. Now, when we looked at the clustering of all the T cells, that's shown here, it's a complex uh, UMAP of 24 different T cell clusters. I'm only gonna highlight a few of these, but just to show you them on the left are the CD4 cells here in the dotted circle, all the CD4 clusters. On the right are all of the CD8 clusters. And um, when we ask uh, what are some of these CD8 clusters, the main population of effector CD8 cells that we're familiar with are called CTL. That stands for cytotoxic T cells. These are express granzyme B. It's shown here in the uh, gene expression uh, shown in the same UMAP. And these are the cells we know about well that are important for killing virally infected cells, tumors. They're the, they're the effector CD8s we think about most of the time. But what was surprising is the most abundant population of CD8 cells in the synovial tissues circled here expressed granzyme K, a different granzyme that we don't really know much about the function of. And so we decided to look more closely, study more carefully, what are granzyme K CD8 T cells doing because we don't know their function and what does granzyme K do because its function is not well understood. Um, this is just to show that we confirm this gene expression data by flow cytometry data. Now, we then took another uh, a, a data set in which we took synovial tissue samples, synovial fluid samples, and peripheral blood samples, did single cell RNA sequencing, amalgamated them all together, and generated a UMAP, which is shown here. And what was striking to us, looking just at the CD8 T cells from all of these different sources, was the fact that these three major metaclusters, each of which has some subclusters, was marked by the granzyme that they expressed. Now the cells down here in gray express no granzymes. Those are the naive T cells. The cells here in blue expressed exclusively granzyme B. Granzyme B is the granzyme that drives cytolysis by cleaving caspases in cytotoxic T cells. And the majority expressed granzyme K, sometimes a combination of K and B together as shown here. And if you look at the relative abundance of these major metaclusters in the different tissue sources, in peripheral blood, this is peripheral blood mononuclear cells, granzyme B CTL dominate. But in synovial fluid and tissue, B is a small proportion of the CD8 cells. The largest proportion contain granzyme K either alone or in combination with B. So the finding here is that the dominant tissue, CD8 T cell, expresses granzyme K. Now, it's not just an RA. We then looked across other autoimmune diseases and compared the percentages of granzyme K to granzyme B CD8 cells. And that's shown here. Um, this is the RA data where granzyme K cells far outnumber in proportion the granzyme B cells. It's also true in Crohn's disease, granzyme K over B. It's also true in ulcerative colitis, granzyme K over granzyme B. And there were about equal numbers of granzyme K and granzyme B cells in lupus nephritis and actually in COVID pneumonia, uh, bronchial VR, alveolar lavage analyses. So the granzyme K CD8 T cells, 
dominate in the inflamed tissues across a bunch of autoimmune diseases, uh, or they're at least equal to the, the granzyme BCTL. So what does it do? What do these cells do um, uh, if they're the predominant cell in inflamed tissues? Well, they're not cytolytic, or granzyme K is not cytolytic. That's shown here, whether we expose cells to granzyme K uh, on the outside of the cell, or we put it inside the cell using Project, which is a perforin-like uh, compound to help it get into cells without killing them. It doesn't cause cytolysis compared to the control. And even the cells that have granzyme K and granzyme B, um, where granzyme B is cytolytic by cleaving uh, caspases, they, they're not really very cytolytic because the perforin levels, the, the molecule needed to create pores to get these granules into a target cell are very low. Um, so in granzyme B cells, the CTL, you have high levels of perforin, but in the granzyme K cells, whether they're K alone or K plus B, perforin levels are very low. And therefore these cells just are not cytolytic. Granzyme K is not cytolytic. And even when granzyme B is there, there's not enough perforin to make them very cytolytic. So what they, do they do? Well, Carlos Donato uh, just finished his graduate work in my lab and took on the project to begin analyzing what are granzyme K's substrates? What does it cleave? That might tell us what it's doing. Um, and he carried out a protein blast overnight. And the next day came in and showed me this data um, of identifying the proteins that granzyme K is most similar to by sequence alignments in BLAST. And of course, it's most similar to a granzyme K precursor because it's granzyme K. Um, and it's also very similar to granzyme A, which is a granzyme very similar to granzyme K. They're both serine proteases. They both cleave uh, base after basic residues. Uh, so that made sense. But we got quite excited because the third most sequence similar uh, protein in the, in the database was complement factor D. A complement factor D is a serine protease that cleaves complement factor B and it's an important uh, enzyme in the alternative pathway of complement activation. And this led us to then ask, well, gee, might granzyme K be cleaving complement components like granzyme B? And we found in the literature here from their uh, atomic crystal structures, we overlay granzyme K and, and complement factor D and you can see they're really very similar in structure. So we asked the granzyme K cleave complement. And the answer is yes, it does. And I'll show you a few slides uh, illustrating this. One of the complement components is C4. And so we asked if we incubated complement component C4 with C1S, this is the enzyme of the classical complement activation pathway that's known to cleave C4. So this is a positive control. And then we asked if these two related granzymes, K and A, could they cleave C4 to generate C4B, the active uh, product? And that's shown here. Here's C4 with an increase in concentration of C1S. It cleaves and regenerates this lower band, which is C4B. Granzyme A didn't do it, but granzyme K did do it. So granzyme K, like C1S, cleaves complement factor four uh, to generate the fragment. It also cleaves complement factor two. And we show that here by combining combining complement factor two with complement factor four, and then adding C1S as a positive control, it generates this lower band, um, which is C2A, which is the cleavage product from C2. And granzyme K does this also. It does it more weakly. You see the band increasing here with increasing concentration. It does it, it turns out to be very important and active, but it doesn't do it as well as C1S. Well, now, if you can cleave complement factor four and complement factor two into C4B and C2A, as we've shown C1S and granzyme K do, they can assemble into a C3 convertase. <clears throat> and this is extremely important because C3 convertase is the central enzyme in all of the complement activation pathways. Once you have an active C3 convertase, you can activate the rest of the pathway. And so we asked if you combine C4, C2, and C3 in the presence of granzyme K, can you generate an active C3 convertase which would cleave C3 to get C3A and C3B? And the answer is yes. Here with C1S, when you combine these three components of complement, you get C3A, granzyme K does it, but granzyme A doesn't. 
and for C3B the same. For C1S, you get the C3B fragment activated cleaved, granzyme K generates it, granzyme A does not. So granzyme K is able to cleave several complement components and generate an active C3 convertase. This is the work of Carlos Donato and Helena Johnson. I'm not going to show you any more compliment. Uh, uh, you probably heard enough compliment for, for one day. Um, but to point out what we're learning these cells do from data I've shown and some I haven't, is that these granzyme KCD8 cells are big interferon gamma producers. They also produce a lot of TNF. They uh, are recognized by TNF and interferon receptors on cells like fibroblasts which then make these complement components in the tissues. And when granzyme K is released, it can generate an active C3 convertase and cleave C3. C3A then can act to cause mast cell degranulation, activate macrophages, et cetera. C3B activates B cells and opsonizes cells. So we think these cells in the inflamed tissue are activating complement and thereby producing a major inflammatory wave in the inflamed tissues, not just RA, but also IBD, Crohn's, et cetera, based on the expression of granzyme K cells dominating in tissues across many diseases. So in summary for this complement part, the three pathways that are known before is the alternative pathway, which uses complement factor D, the classical pathway, which uses C1. I showed you this with my positive control uh, bound to antibodies to cleave C4 and C2 and create the active convertase. The lectin pathway, which uses lectins like mannose binding lectins, binding to microbial glycans, which then cleave these same compounds to create the C3 convertase. And now what we think we've discovered is a new pathway of complement activation coming out of this work, coming from lymphocytes that produce granzyme K that cleave these complement components, generate an active C3 convertase and then produce the anaphylactoxins, the opsonins, and the complement pathway that follows. So I've told you about two T cell populations with their pathogenic, which are newly identified or newly understood that we've identified using these high dimensional uh, approaches. In CD4 cells, we've identified T peripheral helper cells, which we think are thought uh, can be compared to T follicular helper cells where these are the main cells driving B cell differentiation in lymphoid follicles and secondary lymphoid tissues. And these are the main T helper cells driving B cell differentiation in the TB aggregates in the peripherally inflamed tissues like the synovium. And on the CD8 side, we know well about cytotoxic T cells that have granzyme B and kill target cells like in tumors or virally infected cells. And now we've learned about the dominant tissue CD8 cell type being granzyme K positive in inflamed, chronically inflamed tissues and autoimmune diseases. And this cell uh, we believe drives complement activation and inflammation in tissues. And I'll just end um, uh, by showing how we can also use high dimensional analysis to frame these different T cell populations and understand them in a, in a means that uh, uh, stratifies patients uh, with RA. So this was this high dimensional um, uh, pipeline to generate single cell data uh, that we used uh, to characterize the synovial tissues. And the UMAPs from these synovial tissues also allowed us to characterize how many of each cell types were present in each of the patients to allow their stratification. And we did this by forming what we we're calling CTAPs. This is cell type abundance phenotypes in which for all of the synovial samples um, that were analyzed, we show them all here, we, we looked at the proportion of cells that were T cells here in, in uh, gray blue, or B cells, or fibroblasts, or macrophages, or endothelial cells. And you could see we could separate patients uh, whose synovial tissue components were composed mo mostly of T cells, for example, this is this uh, purple bar uh, here. And we found some patients that had a lot of T cells, had a lot of T cells with a lot of B cells here in brown. Others had a lot of T cells with a lot of fibroblasts here in blue. And still others had a lot of T cells, but with a lot of macrophages. And so we're able to divide patients and stratify them based on their proportions of different cell types. Here for T cells, others having mostly macrophages, 
Others lacking T cells and B cells and having mostly fibroblasts and myeloid cells. And then using a new computational approach called covariating network analysis, we're able to look at small regions and, and assess things that um, attributes that vary across the patients uh, based on uh, covarying uh, with another factor that's selected. And so here is the uh, UMAP I showed you for all the T cells. The CD8 T cells were here on the right. The CD4 T cells were here on the left. And so in the CTAP that is composed mainly of T cells and B cells, we can now ask, well, which T cells and which B cells are associated? And so the red indicates that the T cells associated with this TB type of uh, phenotype in this stratified subset of patients, these two subsets are the TP8 cells. And what are downregulated are the granzyme B CTL, they're in blue. On the other hand, in the stratified group of patients that have mostly T cells and fibroblasts, it's a different group of T cells. Now the CTL, the cytotoxic lymphocytes are predominated. And so we can see which populations are predominating and they're different in different CTAPs. And what's really cool is in, for example, the TB CTAP, where we know it's the TPH, the T peripheral helper cells, we can ask which B cells are covarying and also predominating with them. And this begins to predict these T cells are interacting with these B cells. And then we can begin to look at those cell-cell interactions to further understand the pathways that are driving that subset or, or, or that uh, stratified uh, group of uh, patients with uh, autoimmune disease. Um, and so I'll stop there. I wanna thank the members of the Accelerating Medicines Partnership. These are just the PIs of all of the academic sites. And these are the industry partners and uh, uh, foundations that have contributed, all members of the AMP uh, consortium. And then in my lab, I wanna highlight Deepak Rao, who discovered the TP8 cells when he was a postdoc. He's now off in his own lab. Helena Johnson here, who identified the granzyme KCD8 cells, worked closely with Fan Zhang in Shoma Rachaujuri's lab, a computational lab, to help us characterize those granzyme K, uh, 8 uh, granzyme K cells. And Carlos Donato, shown here uh, hiding in the background, the guy who just finished his PhD and identified the granzyme K cleaves complement. I'll stop there and thank you all very much. I'll take questions. Thank you, Michael, for this fantastic uh, talk as usual. Um, now we have some questions from the audience. Uh, begin by Dana's question. Um, what challenges do you face integrating and analyzing such rich data? Hmm. Well, there, <clears throat> there are a lot of computational challenges. Uh, you know, how do you uh, <clears throat> separate batch effects and technical issues um, from biological effects? The, the technical artifacts, I think, are a major problem in single cell studies for, for those of you who, who have done them. Um, uh, even using the same platform, if you analyze samples across different periods of time, when you generate the UMAPs, they'll separate into different clusters based on the batch. Um, and if, if you do different donors in different batches, they'll separate based on the donor. So the need to integrate um, these uh, technical variations, uh, you know, their software, we use Harmony created by Ilya Korsunsky and Shomura Chowdhury, uh, which is, uh, works very well at, at removing batch effects and helping to preserve uh, fundamental biological differences. Um, and then there are other computational challenges. Um, the reason I mentioned the CNA covariant neighborhood analysis when we did um, comparative differential gene expression between clusters, we found some signals, but not as many because it was limited to analyzing the gene expression in the clusters. Um, when we got rid of the clusters and then used covariant neighborhood analysis, now we could get away from clusters and just look at groups of cells that are near one another. And that nearest neighbor analysis allowed us to appreciate a lot of relationships and connections that we couldn't see by doing comparative cluster analysis. And it goes on and on and on. So I, I think there's a big opportunity, a great need. Uh, the people who can best do the analysis is, as I think was mentioned in the introduction uh, to, to this whole symposium, uh, 
the, the, the better you can do the analysis, you're going to see things that other people can't see, or you'll see things that are correctly there rather than artifactually there. And so I think the data analysis is a major, major challenge that remains. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Christoph has a question. Notice that new CD4 or CD8 not presented in neural autoimmune diseases, not sampled or situation in neural <coughs> environment is different. Yeah, we have not looked at them. Um, I do know of one group, I think it's published, um, um, has looked or is looking uh, at MS uh, cerebrospinal fluid and finding high TPH cells there in multiple sclerosis. I, I don't know about other neurological diseases, so I don't know that they're different. The key here is autoantibodies. We do not find TP8 cells in, you know, for example, psoriasis or, or a disease. You've got a lot of chronic inflammation, a lot of T cells, but not a lot of autoantibodies, no T peripheral helper cells. On the other hand, in the autoantibody high autoimmune diseases, so far, pretty much every one that's been looked at has high TP8 cells. So we think it's, you know, driving B cell differentiation in uh, in the diseases that have a lot of autoantibodies and a lot of peripheral TB uh, enrichment in the chronically inflamed tissues. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Um, I was very struck by the identification of this Gradzyme K as a marker of inflamed tissues across conditions. Um, that potentially is a fantastic therapeutic target. Um, so have you tried something in that direction? Mm. Well, we're, we're going there. Again, this is, that's on the, the, um, the Granzyme KCD8 cells actually is in press and science translational medicine. It's actually due to be published, I think on Thursday online. So <laughs> Congratulations. it's, uh, it's, it's, mm. it's uh, essentially almost public, but the complement part is all unpublished data. We, we haven't published yet, it's, it's more recent. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, we did write a patent to, uh, to target this, uh, so hopefully uh, maybe okay. that will be useful. Um, you certainly, uh, I, I think that this does bring out the possibility of targeting grants on K, um, yep. recognizing that it's driving complement. It has other effects too, I didn't have time to present, um, but I think it could be an appealing new target for autoimmune inflammatory diseases. Um, and and uh, we're testing this. We're breeding Granzyme K deficient mice to test it in mouse models, but those experiments aren't finished yet. Thank you, Michael. We will take a last question uh, uh, to respect the time. How will you translate the differences like in CTAPs to different clinical meaning in different individuals? How far is this from applying this info into precision medicine? Yeah. So, no, I think this is a good question. And I think we're, we're putting this in the category of precision medicine. This is exactly idea. So, um, for example, in the MCTAP, CTAP is again, cell type uh, association phenotype where, where the, the, the stratified group is defined by the proportions of the particular cell types they have. In a, cell in, in a CTAP like the MCTAP, which is full of inflammatory macrophages, targeting inflammatory macrophages and their products might be predicted to work therapeutically. But if you look at the macrophages in some of the other CTAPs, they're not the inflammatory macrophages, they're more the tissue resonant MRTK positive macrophages, which are somewhat inflammatory, but not particularly. So you could look at the CTAP and imagine, you know, you would use different therapies in different places. For those that have high T cells, like T cell, B cell, TB, CTAP, like I showed you, you know, in my example, well, that might be a good place, you know, to use abatacet or rituximab, things that target T cells and B cells and, and antibodies to TNF or macrophage products might not be quite as effective in that setting because it's predominantly T cells and B cells. So you can, we, we hope, and, and what I, you know, would have to be tested, you know, empirically, uh, clinically, um, is that the CTAPs may direct therapy. The second possibility, which is what we're very actively working on in the lab, is that as I showed you using these CTAPs, now we can predict which cells, which cluster of T cells is interacting with which cluster of B cells. Mm -hmm. and, and this is giving us cell-cell interaction data that we can now look at to try to understand the pathways and the interactions which are driving the pathology in that stratified group. So I think this is toward precision medicine. Uh, 
clinically re clinical relevance remains to be proven, um, but uh, certainly this will uh, provoke the uh, desire in many groups to kind of ask this question. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Michael, once again for a fantastic talk and, and joining us today and these interactions.